Good morning. Give yourself a round of applause for making it. Um, can you hear me okay? Well, a bit I, can, I can put the mic on maybe a little better. Okay. So the first thing I want to say is thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your professional lives and being here. Um, and oh well to a live show. Thank you for coming to all the sessions and the speakers appreciate it. Um, what we do as a profession in nurse, um, as a nurse, I've um, been doing this for about 35 years now. And what we do matters. It's key to the health of our nation. The speaker, the speaker, the speaker, and we'll cry. We're right. So stand in the middle. <laughs> what we do matters is the health of our nation. We don't come to like this. We charge, we invigorate, network, talk with your colleagues, um, learn from the speakers and their experiences. Um, we're going to find ourselves um, with less and less nurses in our profession. Um, I served in the military for over 20 years, I retired in 2009. I did a consulting time off. Um, since then, I worked in fixed facilities, the ambulatory market. Uh, so I do a lot of different things. and. Um, I'm proud of what I do. I travel the country a lot, at least in the past. Um, not so much now because I consider myself semi retired. Um, but you know what? It's like um, the Godfather said they just suck you back in. <laughs> Same thing, they suck right back in. So I'm kind of glad about that, though. I'm, I'm very active. I'm kind of busy in many ways or ADHD. I got to be doing something. So um, I talk with many of you, some of you in the audience. And I want to encourage you to be a speaker here at one today or another conference. I want to encourage you to write an article about something you're passionate about. I want you to present a poster. I want you to do more because not many people are encouraged to do on a daily basis at your job. So I can be sitting in the room, you've got time, the colonel's done, you this, you that. But I'm going to encourage you. Okay, so thank you again for being here today. Um, share your time with me. I have no financial disclosure to. Um, Talk to you about today because I'm doing this for free. Don't get paid. <laughs> if you wouldn't advertise it in a newspaper on a billboard, why would you do something different? Right? Everybody brags about their surgical care, they're certified with this. We're stroke certified, we're this certified, we're that certified. But the reality is, there's a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes in our, in our operating rooms and central sterile spaces that the general public is really involved in, but we see it every day. So the reality and the perception of what we do is looking at, looking at myself in the mirror, I sometimes pull in the mirror, I'm 40 months lighter, and held a lot better looking, but the reality is that's what I see in the mirror. When you see something each and every day, we become blind to what's in front of us. But the perception and reality is when I come in, surgical services, central sterile managers, the directors don't always like what I find or see in the telephone because it's a very different picture. <laughs> so today's presentation is really going to be a tutorial and some conversations about what I'm seeing across the country. And these are real pictures from everywhere I did, okay? So this picture here has a couple problems going on. Um, what you're gonna see is um, the blinds here. So a lot of people still have blinds in their operating rooms in the central sterile space. Not supposed to be there, take them down, okay? They don't need to be there, there's other solutions to block the window. But what's a big problem here is um, the sun can, comes in in these windows and you can kind of see the shadows on the counter there. But the way they're also storing their instruments uh, because the single pane window, you got either heat or cold outside, or heat and cold inside, and it doesn't blend, right? So if it's a very hot day, you got running air conditioner, you can see the condensation. But look at how they're storing the instrumentation. It's right next to the window. So when I took this photograph, what I should have done was take the photograph on the side so you can see it touching the window. So we have a wet window touching the blue wrapper so you have strike through. So we know that instrument. Uh, instrument sets are contaminated. But also the problem is look at how they're storing. You should never be storing instruments like that on your side 
that should all be flat. And I don't know if you know this, but you're not supposed to stack blue rabbit items. Okay? So we've got a couple of problems going on here. How about your storage of your field packs and some of your instrumentation? Look at how they've got the blue wrapper stuff on top of field packs. There's cramming field packs in the drawers. You can't find anything. And then when there's a hole in that wrapper, what do they do? They play a sterile process. But this is being stored in the operating room or in your sub sterile space. The bottom center picture of the problem becomes it's double field pack. Now you can double field pack instruments though, but you can't fold over the internal package. Okay, it has to be flat. Because what they found is um, doing studies, there's no air evacuation. You can't guarantee steam touch the space in between when it's folded. Okay, so you gotta be very careful. Look at the way they're storing this instrument set on top of blue wrapper items, right? Guarantee we're gonna have a problem with the hole. But thank God, from the center picture, healthcare workers don't wash their hands. So they're gonna be Right? So thankfully, we don't do something. Hmm. You can see this drawer has a mix of the left picture is a mix of metal instrument containers on top of blue wrapper mixed in field packs. But this is what's kind of out there. Um, many OR nurses, as they're trained, are really trained in sterile processing. So they may not know that this is reality, that this isn't the way it's supposed to be. And this is their reality. Here we got again blue wrapper items. You got a blue wrapper item sandwich between two metal containers. Absolutely a no no. The bottom middle picture, they have shampoo there. Kind of makes sense. And those are manuals inside that bin that they haven't used in 30 years. You should have seen the dust that I got out of that container. I asked them, why do you have shampoo? Sometimes we have to shampoo our patient's hair. Wonderful. Why is it here with your instrumentation? The other thing is ergonomics. Look at this shelf, it's broken. These instruments slide off, they put them on the, the cookie sheets. But it slides off and it hits the rack in the back and it kind of holds. Not only did it delay a certain procedure, but they didn't have another instrument set to back it up. So now we have a patient under anesthesia. We don't have an instrument set. And oh, by the way, this, this is so broken that some nurse or technician is going to end up getting hurt and have a broken not playing against the organization because they're trying to keep everything from falling. Instrument sets are heavy. When we do this, we put people at risk. Is it sterile or unsterile? Sterile. I found this on an instrument shelf with everything else. No one saw it was sterile. We pulled it, made sure nothing was done. We barely went through the cleaning process. Um, but if we don't teach ourselves, if we don't teach each other, we don't set the standard. How does somebody know if they're going to need to get trained properly? So this is the reality of what's happening. I pulled these three instruments set these three instruments out of that. Basin. So we know the cleaning process starts at that point of use. In the old days, I used to work, I used to scrub a whole lot, and at the end of the day, I used to have to put my instrument sets together. So whatever I did to myself created my own workload at the end of the day. But then decades later, we separated the two departments. So why should I worry about it? Somebody else is doing it. Well, when the proteins dry, it begins fitting instrumentation. So it degrades the instruments themselves. The scissors will become dull. Clamps may not clamp properly. And when things have pits, that causes us other problems because if we don't clean them properly through the contamination process, we can then introduce um, bacteria or other disease to our patients. How about tape? You all got tape in your OR. So this is an autoclave tape. We all know what it looks like, right? We know the purpose of it. At least I would hope so, right? So the outer wrapper. It gives us the first indication that it went through a sterilization process. It doesn't guarantee sterility because that tape in, um, will change colors depending on the temperature. So if you keep it in the trunk of your car, like Chuck Hughes said yesterday, um, it'll turn. If you keep it inside your vehicle when it gets so hot, it'll start turning brown and black. First time we learned this was when I was deployed and I uh, was very hot climate. And when we got our shipment from the warehouse, all the tape had turned black because it was just so hot. So that's just your first indicator. But tape is not supposed to be used on your baskets and internal components. So look, and this is this is um, three different clients. So this 
this pic, let's see, which one is it? Yeah, this picture is the same client. And the reason there's two of them is I wanted you to see that it's not just tape on the top, but there's tape on the side. This was a separate client. They're using a sticker, which is um, rated to be serialized. So that's okay. That's probably uh, a, a tracking system, maybe I see now some other, and that's okay. But this autoclave tape is not okay. Here, um, it's not so much the pan, but it's the pan inside that's holding the smaller items that you put a label on. And you know where those labels are coming from? Those little machines you can buy from Staples and you plug it in and it peels out. Oh, that's pretty. Let's stick it out. That's not ready for time temperature and sterilization. And it should never be there. Second, steam is water. And water can't penetrate the glue with the stickiness of the tank. So this is technically worse than or equal to biofer. But everybody in the country I go to is doing a very similar thing. Here you've got loader instruments, set number four, top right picture, that's coming from the vendor. Same thing, from staples, printed it out, stuck it on there. Again, autoclave tape, these are internal packaging, they did a peel pack, which is fine, everything was, was good with the packaging, except again, the little sticker labels are there, and again, here. So we just can't create what we want to create just because it's convenient and simple. We've got to actually do the right thing. So if you're a circulating nurse and you see this, this is contaminated. Okay? Don't use it. If you do, you're putting your patients at risk. So a lot of hospitals will jump in the hoops and can't figure out why we're having so many infections. Well, let's get down the basics and figure this out. Cell processing is a very important department and should be valued for what they do. But if we're doing this, then we're not working well together. How many of you use metal pans, like the Aspilet pans, Genesis pans, et cetera? And when I go to client sites, they have generation after generation after generation of pans. It's never standard. They try to at one time, right? Gold means heart, and red means GYN, and blue means general surgery, right? It's related to the colors. But then over the years, they get beat up, broken, they throw them out, they get mixed up. This particular pan has a uh, ceramic type filter, so we're used to paper filters. This is an older model, probably 20 years old, and the ceramic filter works based on its high temperature pressure, so it will seal itself once it's in the autoclave process. Problem with this is it's a spring loaded pan, so it's two lids in one lid, if you will. So when you, when you pull these springs out, the internal lid will come out. Right? It, it, it separates. But when it separated, look what I found, the dust. And all this grime, dusty grime was right there on the internal. And that was what I pulled off the shelf and pulled sterile instruments out. Here's another example, same kind as the small pan. Look at the dust bunnies we found in there. And you say, where, where does dust come from? We're supposed to be cleaning all the time. But when we walk, right, our scrubs, um, I was surprised that I see that color dust. You can see the color of the scrub, right? And it's green or whatever. But that's amazing. So if you have these types of pads, please separate the lids and see what you got. How about buzz? <laughs> so this is an instrument set. So you can see the technician's foot right there, right? He called me to the room. He said, Dave, I got an issue. I said, okay, let's see what it is. <laughs> We found the bug. And what happens is we don't maintain our pants. People think they're indestructible when they're not. They're just like anything else that you can maintain. So the seal around the top was not good. And what ended up happening is the um, cricket crawled up inside, we sterilized it. He met his demise, but if the technician didn't catch it, we would have used that other patient. How about maintaining your equipment? Here we got um, an autoclave that um, the operating room wasn't using anymore. Um, you can see it in the off position. If you're not using the auto bay anymore because it's obsolete, it's broken, remove it and get rid of it. Because one, you can use the space, right? If you, if you imagine a, a small autoclave and how much space square foot wise that it takes up because it's a small empty room, take all that out and get all that extra square footage to store things properly instead of climbing over everything when we need that positioner. But then look at all the dust that works because it is this here. And I said, well, what's the problem? I said, you got a joint room five feet away. That's the problem. 
and you're telling me you've got infections, and you're trying to figure out why, let's fix the variables that we can control before we start blaming anesthesia or blaming the surgeon or blaming the technician or the techniques. Let's clean up. Look at the chemicals that we use. Now, those chemicals we use in sterile processing is really for rendering the instrumentation safe to handle by the technicians in the prep and pack area. So deep kind, we have to wear all our PPE. We wash it, we sonic it, we put it through the washer and contaminator. Once it leaves a deep contaminator, we can touch it, right, without PPE. Yet. We don't need gloves and gowns anymore. But it's because of the chemicals that we use in combination with the temperature and water to make that right. Look at how that one one of them bottle is. Are you trying to get the last bit out of there? When was the last time you even checked those chemicals? And then you obviously see all this filthy dirt and dust. Some containers are empty. They got bath towels and sheets on the floor because water drips. Everything we do, there's a science to it. We have to do well. And they weren't doing it very well here. And in fact, I would venture to say that they're putting their, their staff at risk. Water trays. We all have them, right? It's most of us. We do any kind of orthopedic spine work. And even in some um, other specialties, loners are, are common. So this picture, I want you to imagine yourself looking into that room, just like you are. Right behind you is a, a bank of elevators. So my question, as I'm observing this space, was the people walking in and out. So they come off the elevator, they put the loaner trays in there, and then they leave. So I asked the leader of that OR, what are they doing? They go, oh, those are the vendors. So oh, great. So you're telling me that this thing, when they fill this up, we roll back down to sterile processing, we do our thing, and we wrap it and sterilize it. Oh, no, they're sterile. <laughs> is it really? I said, the standard is you're supposed to clean, re rewash, re put them in a decontaminator, re prep and pack them to ensure there's no buyer burden, right? You can't trust another OR or sterile processing market to do it properly. And then second, this is no matter of this vehicle. So what's the what's the temperature and humidity of this trunk? And how long has it been in this trunk before they put them here? She didn't think it was a problem. Yes, ma'am. David, I'm used to doing environmental I'm, I'm used to walking around with the head of PBS, the head of engineering, the head of nursing, the head of, you know, there's a couple of, you know, leaders in this, in this rounding process. And we're looking for water leaks, stain tile, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Does this not happen? Elsewhere? <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. And sometimes it's no. Why is because of all the many people in the world? So this morning, I went to bed about midnight last night. Got up at 5.30 with my friend following a death call schedule to talk about this. She actually works for the Joint Commission. Because I have some concerns about a visit that I gave this client. And the owner has to find how their sterile processing kit. Now, sterile processing was wrong. Okay? They absolutely, the findings that were there were absolutely accurate. But nobody checked the OR, and if they did, they put the over on everything. So holes in the wall, the drywall, right? Flaking stuff coming off the ceiling, sterile processing, or sterile instruments that with expiration stickers. So it was really bad. Fire extinguishers have had to be checked in six months, and how many times have you gone through fire safety, right? So those answers, yes, it does happen. No, it doesn't happen. And the folks that are in charge, the OR director, for example, it's very easy to glance over the problems when your chief nurse or chief operating officer doesn't have a clue what it's supposed to be. They're relying on me, the leader, to tell them. And if I'm not, if I either don't know or don't want them to know, it's not. The other thing is, healthcare's changed a lot. There's a lot of yes people. A lot of people out there that will not stand up for the right thing. They're going to keep the job. So it's a hard thing. And you're going to see a lot more of that here. So, not only was that a problem, but look at the room. They're storing anesthesia cards, external shipping boxes, the suitcases that we get our scopes and other instruments in that we have to ship out when they need repairs. All of that's crammed into this space. Ever hear of a 510K on IFU? Instructions for use? So, this hospital thought it was 
smart that they're going to create their own medical products and use it on patients. So this nurse took, if you're looking at pictures of Walmart, Good Value, which is a generic brand, sandwich bag. We're not talking a Ziploc, we're talking an old tiny sandwich bag that used to get them. When I, went to, when I was in grade school, they would flip it over. So they bought those, and then she took some suture, very expensive suture off the shelf, and she made her own pouch. And they were using that for all their laparoscopic call labs. So I told you about the internal packaging. You can't fold over your um, pill packs, right? Well, there's so many folds in this sandwich bag. You think it ever seen ever touched anything in there? So I said, could you please cease and assist? And let's get your chief nurse down here and figure this out because this is wrong. This is so wrong, you don't even understand. I said, you better get the checkbook out now because somebody's going to jail and they're writing a big check. Um, they're still doing it today because it saves them money. And they can know administration even after they I will talk about that in a minute. So where do you uh, where did you say that is located? <laughs> and when I circulate, it's always in the back corner and I can move through the cabinets and shelving and equipment just to get there. How about the bed and waste? Y'all have to work, right? <laughs> what I like about this is her in, in Texas, we call them malibus. Um, her biscuits are, are rubbed against the engine. And then her part, and that's the same lady, by the way. Um, she couldn't reach the top. So what is she doing? One, her economic weight is bad, she's going to get hurt. But what is she doing? She puts her foot up on the bottom shelf. And what did she just do? She just really gets that set, right? So I watched her all day. And I only waited, I, you know, everything I did was to, to, to not say something, but I watched her all day until she started reaching for instruments on that bottom shelf that I know she really did. And I said, you gotta stop. You can't have anything like that. And then, what do you mean? And I showed her my photographs that I took. I said, your foot touched it. Foot's on the floor. You are still filthy. It's contaminated. Please don't do this. So that's happening. All right. How many people use this in their OR? Everybody, right? Everybody. How many of you know that Parks Medical came out in 2015, almost four years ago now, that we cannot use those probes under the skin? Raise your hand if you know it. Got this letter. One person. You can't use them where? You can't use them inside the body. Yeah. Oh, okay. So what we do is we wipe them down with a cap side because you can't wash them. And we stick them usually in a peel pack and then we sterilize them. Usually low temperature. And then we take them and we open them up on our back table. And when we're doing the carotid and directed, we just them over there to see if we've got flow. When we do open hearts, we're going to see if we've got flow. When we catch a leg open, we just check them to see if we've got flow. Four years ago, they came out and said, stop. We've told you this for decades that you can't use them. The class of device matters. If you end up with an infection in one of your patients and you're using this, you're wrong. When Phyllis or I get called to stand and help the lawyers, what do you think I'm going to tell them? I'm pulling out my God and you say, oh, by the way, four years ago, they told you. They've been telling you for years, you just didn't do it. Then they put it in right because they're not going to be liable for your bad behavior. So what's the alternative? There's disposable versions that you can purchase. You just have to do the research, right? But hospitals don't want to pay the money because that's cheap. Um, so we're talking about perioperative practices. So hey, Susan and I were just talking in the back. So you have a few questions from me. I told them to be here. I don't want you to read all of this. I just want you to know that when we talk about standards, AOM has there some recommended practice standards. Um, they has some recommended practice standards, especially for steam sterilization, which is SC79. I highly recommend that you have both of those um, current recommendations. Amy doesn't come out every year like AOM guidelines. Amy's every couple years or several years. So the last, this is 2017 is the current volume. The last one was 2010. Okay, so there are several years in between. But what's important about this is the closed or clamped instrumentation. Right? There's a lot of debate arguments about 
closing methods and innovation inside the mission So I have a client that um, we set up several process for missing task forces, and the OR has been bullying SPD for years. Now SPD has been broke, bad man. Um, but they don't deserve to be bullied. Now they produce 9,000 widgets a month, two hospitals, and they have an error rate of less than half a percent. Pretty darn good. When you look at the literature in the industry, a lot of organizations are stuck at three and four percent, and that's good for them. But you know, one percent, zero percent is what we should get. We need to get to zero. But if you have half a percent with nine thousand instruments over two campuses, it's a pretty good number. But the OR, because of their people ways, um, if they find an instrument clamp, one little instrument, right? Say it was your your tally or your mosquito, they would discard the entire instrument site, throw it away, causing them grief. Then they complain to the surgeon, oh, we don't have the instrument, they have to wait and flash it or do whatever, one tray or whatever they're going to do. Delay everything, get patients under anesthesia for one instrument. I said, well, one instrument doesn't make sense to me. If the cerebral processing technician did that, Okay, you can see maybe where the error is, so do a variance. Give me the tape with your initials so that I can watch them, observe, teach, educate, mentor, coach. I figured out. I said, but you have to understand an instrument set, there's the stuff inside moves. And when you put your stuff on your, your stringer, that shifts. If it shifts the wrong way, it can actually close. They said, not impos impossible. I said, really? Let's talk about this. Take it off the product after it's sterilized. Take it off the product after it's I put it on the shelf before I put it in the case. Card. They take it out and put it on a rinse now. They don't use it. They put it back in the case. Card. It goes back to me, goes back to the shelf. How many times did I move it? 10 times, 15 times, 20 times before they actually used it? I said, every time you move it, there's a potential that it goes. Second thing, same as a model. I know what AO rent says. And I know those CD personally. And she was quoted in 2018 version of the recommendation. It was an old study, but nobody's ever taken one instrument out in a controlled environment to culture it. So the question I have is if it's a molecule, should we maybe just move that one instrument, maybe, and throw it away? You know, take it off the table and use the rest of the instruments? Is anything else technically around it is there? It was a big debate. Of course, again, the award holding everybody. I said, and I had a few minutes on the agenda, so I had to pause because my time, my time was over. And I said, let's put this on the agenda for the next week. And I need 30 minutes. So what I did is I pulled randomly just instruments off my out of my bins in the sterile processing space. And I said, is this instrument sterile? Right, let's don't hold me a wrench. Well, maybe not, but let's kind of go forward. So how about your wheat landers? You have two wheat landers and two galleries in every basic set that you have. Isn't there a ratchet there? So I'm like a good lawyer. I always know the answer before I ask it. So I showed them and I said, well, oh, it's open, it's closed. Ratchet's always going to be touching. Is that not contaminated? How is that different than a, a ratchet on a single instrument? Couldn't answer that question. How about your double action instruments? I said, so when it's open, you got metal touching metal. I said, what's even more important is this space. This is a, what we call a spring. And this is heavy poundage, right? So pound per square inch. If you try to separate, that's going to be very difficult, which is much harder or much more pressure metal on metal when it touches than a ratchet would be on a simple mosquito. I said, if I put a rubber band at the bottom, I can't do that to open it because now nothing the seam would get underneath the rubber band. So, so how is this different? They couldn't ask that question. I said, how about this one? It's not just metal on metal for spring. This actually has a pivoted version, so there's no way to clean inside that. I said, this should have been thrown away decades ago because you can't clean it properly. I said, how about these? They don't separate. This is like the old. Um, uh, Harrison, right? They didn't separate, but they still use these every day. I said, there's metal and metal there. Then that piece of the was installed was the anchor. Did you know that these old tiny anchors aren't a solid tube? 
um, take the tip that inside the handle is open. And when I stick a brush in there, no matter how big or small it is, I can't clean that surface properly. So at that committee, I said, we really need to get rid of these today. They need to get out of your set. We'll call the chairman to get some responsible we'll manager. Two months went by, they still didn't pull on the answer set because the, 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 the OR director refused because the doctor's money was now we had a position on our consulting team and he got he lost his mind that day. He said, enough is enough. You're giving sterile processing hell because one person <coughs> gets clamped in a set. We claim all of these statistics reading from the Bible that you can't do that, but you're unwilling to have a conversation with your surgeons when he just told you he can't clean it. And they still use it. So I cut, I had to move out, maintenance cut me one half. And I showed them. I said, not only is there bio burden in here, there's trust. You've got to be better. And they fought and fought and fought. And to this day, three months later, they still have the anchor sessions and some of their sessions are certain to use anything else. So what you accept is what you teach. If we accept this in our industry and we turn a blind eye or refuse to educate ourselves, this is what you're going to be faced with. I can guarantee you, with the knowledge that I have, if I have surgery and I end up with an infection, you better get your checkbook out because I know all the sturdy secrets. And I'm going to ask you did you track that instrument set? Who touched it? Where was it? When did you sterilize it? I want to know everything. Because my lawyer is not going to know what questions to ask, so I'm going to prompt him or her. So, everybody's watching, folks. You may not be. Are those people who I took pictures of are, but everybody else is watching. Everybody. So I'm going to show you some stuff that's in the industry, and uh, I might cut this video off. This is a little bit longer. Yes, she says in most hospitals, people who are paid to do this work are hourly minimum 
replaces all of its surgical instruments after contamination with CJD. Over 20,000 instruments had to be replaced. And we know, if you and know anything about the surgery, it's very expensive. So not following life guidelines caused a big budget hit for this organization. And budget hits like this can close the doors of the hospital. Okay. Uh, North Carolina Hospital washed instruments with hydraulic fluid. All right, this is at Duke University back in 2005. How many of you have heard about this story? And quite a few of you. It was the first story I ever heard of when it went live. Um, for those of you who have not, let me just kind of, and I'll spend just a little bit on this slide, otherwise I'm gonna kind of breeze through the rest of the, the deck. But um, what happened here was um, sterile processing was doing the right thing. Okay, so I wanna make that clear uh, for all accounts of what we know from the story. They use 50 gallon drums, if you will, for their um, uh, enzymatics and detergents, um, which is common. You go more to a five gallon now, which you're going to see in a lot of places, but a big sterile processing environment took a lot of that stuff. So, what they did is they took the empty ones that they had to replace it, and then the empties they took to the loading dock to be you know, sent back to the manufacturer, recycled, and thrown away. Nobody knows um, really from the story. Same time, the um, Elevator company came to repair the elevator and they had to remove the hydraulic fluid. So they didn't know where to put it. So they found these drums on the dock. They came, took the hydraulic fluid out of the elevator so they could repair it, took that old nasty hydraulic fluid, put it on the loading dock. And the same steps, if you will, materials management comes said, Oh, that's the sterile processing, you better deliver it. Put a dolly in it, took it to the sterile, took it to the sterile processing department, hooked it up, and started using it. Thousands of surgical procedures had occurred, and then nobody figured out that why is this feel so slippery and slimy and nasty? Finally, a few surgeons kind of you know, started kicking their feet. They started looking into it and found out that it was actually hydraulic fluid, not enzymatics. So not only did we put our patients at risk, we put our employees at risk because nothing was decontaminating those instruments, and they weren't using PPE when they were putting those sets back together. So this went on and on for years in a lawsuit because the hospital said, well, it's an elevator company's fault. The elevator company said, we didn't put it. We didn't hook that stuff up. 
you know, that type of stuff. So it went on for years and years and ended up settling on a court. But the reality is patients were affected. And for many, many years, the hospital's gonna be liable for testing those patients for any potential thing or harm that they cause. So big problems there. Um, we're gonna go through these pretty quickly, but I just want you to kind of see and point out that um, five women here allegedly contracted staph infections during a surgical procedure with contaminated instruments. There's actually another video, but I'm gonna to skip to that. Uh, they went to court and um, they were fighting it. In fact, the surgeon um, um, was part of the witness and uh, was a whistleblower in these facilities and then the hospital went against the physician. So nobody's safe when it comes to the hospital doing bad stuff. So this physician who's a high volume surgeon is speaking out against this as a whistleblower and they're gonna hold him accountable. You know, what, what are we supposed to do? So we'll go on here. Filthy surgical instruments, the hidden threat in America's operating rooms. These are big facilities, pretty outside, pretty inside, lots of money being spent. Eight patients in New Hampshire told surgical equipment may be exposed, may have exposed them to a brain disease. And look at the news agencies. You're gonna find that I'm gonna, I put where I found this. So these links are to this new story. So everything has a, uh, a reference to it. But the point is, these are big news organizations reporting this, so the general public is hearing it. Parents who New Orleans Hospital, allegedly using unsterile equipment. Super bug epidemic in our midst. We know about all this, the um, flexible scope stuff that we've been dealing with. Super bug found in suburban hospital in Chicago. Big issue there. Many patients there were affected, right? We have uh, and this was back in uh, 2013, 2014 when this stuff happened. Here we got 2014, it continues. We've got many, many patients exposed. This one I found in, uh, in my travels. I actually picked up the USA. I was in on there. I was them up at the counter when you're um, entering or exit in the hotel. And I looked at this and I was like, holy mackerel, look at this. Big, big um, paper. We obviously didn't make the front page. But we certainly made a full spread ad of what's going on in America. Fox News, Deadly Superbug, patients in Seattle. Here we've got uh, Virginia Mason Hospital, 32 patients died, 11 died, but 32 of them were affected. Here we got nightmare bacteria on soaps again, another story, and another story, and another story. And another story. Here we got 12,000 children and young adults were treated here. That's a lot of people to track. 11 died in here. And these are big facilities. It keeps going and going and going. VA always gets a bad rap, but they're the most underfunded and understaffed organizations in the country. This was in my hometown, San Antonio. This was one of my sister hospitals. The lady, I couldn't get the video of it so late for some reason. This wouldn't be that properly. But she's on a news crime. Big alligator tears. They wrote a big sign for that. It's a bad day. The hospitals in San Antonio are under one license, one CMS license. So if you have five or six hospitals in your group that's under one license, an episode like this could close down the entire organization, so all five, six, seven hospitals could be closed down because of something like this. See, there was a big article in the New York Times just last week on um, the infection rate from the blood scopes. Yep. And I use it in endoscopy instance. I do a lot of anesthesia uh, for endoscopy. That's a real concern because I'm constantly watching how, how our staff. I mean, we're all getting to that age where we need these. <laughs> uh, dirty missing instruments blame DMC. DMC has been going through problems forever, forever. In fact, I know some very key people in the cell processing world. They were asked to go here and try to fix the problem. But they weren't ready for a fix. They went a quick band-aid approach to get it done, get out of the news, and keep going forward on the great surgery. Many, many years of problems. Um, this one was a little bit more recent, 2017. Um, there's a lot of investigations going on here. Um, even for my medical center, I used to work there in 96. Big army facility. And I used to work in that sterile processing uh, department. 
but because of the complexity of the expectation, anybody's vulnerable to this problem. They shut down their surgery department as soon as it happened. They were still doing emergency surgery, but they essentially shut it down. How many civilian hospitals are going to shut down their own line? Not one, because that's the biggest revenue generator for your own organization. More and more patients are at risk. Keeps going, 2018, San Diego. Here's the Denver Post recently. How about this one? If you've not heard about it, we've understaffed and underfunded our central processing department for years as a result. We may put your life at risk. Do you think this would go over well? We put this billboard up on the city. People would say, well, there's surgery there. Do you think maybe our surgeons might think quiet? If you heard in the video about, they didn't know. She's used that, that device thousands of times. She never knew. Most of our surgeons don't, most of us don't. And so hopefully this is annoying you a little bit. So who's running your hospitals? The big cities, right? Who's, what's your board doing? Why isn't your board speaking up? And what the hell is the medical staff doing? So I work with a lot of chief medical officers and they're part of the problem. They don't want to change. Because if they have to speak up against their uh, medical staff, oh my God. They may not have a job tomorrow because, of course, a high volume surgeon, he doesn't like it, he's what you're doing. But the reality is, we've got a lot of problems. So, why is it so important? Well, it's important from a human perspective, right? Um, but it's the business we're in. We, we talk about it in doubt, throw it out. And I think we do that pretty good. But look at all the things that I showed you just in the last 20 or 30 slides. What's happened? So, people are turning a blind eye to it. The big reason, too, from a financial perspective, is surgical service is critical to the hospital's viability. Um, most of the margin is coming, uh, and profit is coming from the operating room. And when you have a profitable operating room, you can have a mother baby area, you can have a cancer program, you can have a pediatric program. All the stuff in healthcare that doesn't pay anymore can be funded because of a very robust surgical program. So do you think administrators are going to close down the surgery? No, that they want surgery to run 24 7. Right? The difference is between the three organizations is that anesthesia wants to work from 7 to 5 and make sure they get some time for lunch. Administration wants to run your OR 24 7 no matter what. Nurses want to work from 7 to 11 to your 2 hour lunch because that's not free. They don't ask you the same way. <laughs> so there's a comedy. But I'm here to tell you that it's not all bad. Okay, there are some other things. I'm going to end early so we can do some questions and answers. They talk about some of the problems you might be facing. Here's my philosophy whenever I'm running an operating room, if you got time to clean, you got time to clean. And I'm me, I don't care what you are PhD, RN, ENP. If you're working for me and, you're, and we're not doing cases, you're cleaning, you're checking out dates or figuring it out. When you work in my OR, you won't find city blue or tape on anything. Because I will make my nurses use a, a case of blue bar. And when they're so sick and tired of cleaning their furniture and equipment, they're never going to use tape again. Trust me. So they want to do it again. So when my staff sees me put on scrubs, which is pretty often, but when they start seeing me really looking at stuff, they know I'm, I'm on a tirade trying to figure out why they didn't work. Because, you know, with the OR, if you ain't doing cases, they want to send you home. I don't believe in that philosophy, so you're going to be working for them and do something. If I'm willing to mop floors, you better gosh darn better be willing to do it. You don't want to do it very long. So these are three of my past employees who I love to death, and we were cleaning everything. Here's a client that I found that actually uses a metal pan or basket, if you will. And what's important here is what you're seeing is the screws. Okay, so this is right here, these two little labels. And then on the back side, they're using screws or rivets to hold them in place. So that's um, been rated and, and validated that, that that's good. So steam sterilization will take care of that. Um, but that's a lot better than using tape, don't you think? Right? There's products out there that we can purchase so we don't have to use all that other tape tape to hold stuff together. Here's a client that actually measures out their um, fluids. They're in a clear container, so you can actually see the level. So when it gets low, you know to replace it. It's based on a calibrated system. So you fill the water up to this line, you press the button, and it pulls the right amount of solution that you need to clean your instrumentation. 
How many times do you go, that's eh, not enough? You don't want to use too much. You don't want to use not enough. Because if you don't use the right ratio, it just won't make the instruments clean. Um, here's another version. Here's the five gallon jugs that I was talking about. These are tilted um, in this special device. And then again, everything feeds out through this calibrated machine. Here's the right way to start, uh, saw, uh, store your blue wrapper items, some individual shells. And what you don't see in this picture is this shell, they don't ever touch it, the instruments that they pull the shell out. You see this? They put the whole shelf in there so there's less chance that they're going to put a hole in the wrapper. Okay? If you go to some of the big expos, you're going to find these companies out there and they're really growing rapidly because everybody's storing their stuff wrong. Here's a product, uh, and these products, I don't endorse any companies, so I'm going to tell you the names of the company, but I'm not endorsing them. It's just I've seen the product, and I like it, um, but that may not necessarily work for you. So let me just put that caveat in there. This here is the Hanel, H-A-N-E-L, with a little umlaut. It's a German company, and it's a rotomat. What's nice about this product is um, you can quadruple or exponentially increase your um, square footage because everything's done vertically. You can put all your shot images rotate. Okay? And what's nice about it is um, in our hostels we have a drop ceiling, right? Well, you might have 10 feet or 20 feet or 40 feet of um, um, space between um, this floor and the next. So the rotor mat can actually go into the ceiling all the way up. And if you're, there's nothing below, they can actually go below you in the floor. So you might only see a small cabinet. But when you press the buttons, it's rotating and it spits out your instrument set or the supplies you need. When I seen this, the first time I seen this, it was at the uh, San Jose factory for um, um, Olympus, where they repair all the flexible scopes, the rigid scopes. Um, and they had a system and they had 10,000 scopes in this tiny little space. You would never imagine you could fit that many. So I started looking for this company at the various conferences and I absolutely love it. And the long history of humankind and animal kind to those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. I believe it's time for us to evaluate the standards of care practices in our facilities. If you don't know where to start, give me a call. I am from the business card up here if you're interested. Um, email me if you have questions, no problems, free, free of charge. Um, your patients are kind of need to do the right thing. Absolutely. I'm going to open up for questions or discussion. So, floor is yours. So, the DJT, that pressure dull disease, what do you do with those instruments? So, we try to identify patients that might have the disease and we separate those. They have to go through a completely different sterilization process and change the parameters on your um, autoclaves and everything. But what most facilities do is they throw those instruments away. Even though they're very expensive, we try to buy, we minimize the set size so we don't throw as much away. And pretty much it's just trash because it's easier to throw it away to try to fix it. Because if you don't kill that bug, you will affect everybody as long as you use that set because it never goes away. Okay. That's what I wasted. Yeah. So I appreciate what you're saying about the rest of the instrument and all the discussion. What do you do when you have a separate room? But ARA, ASP, uh, SP79, they all say that the wretched instrument is in a wretched condition, which leaves the rest of the <coughs> instrument set unsterile. And that's the interpretation. It does. But in this day and age, we have to start being a little bit more scientific and critically thinking. So what I've done is I this client finally succumbed to all their gas and started listening. In fact, they asked the anesthesiologist who was in the room first, and it was literally on the nurse's side because they didn't want the patients affected either. Finally understood. And then you have to also understand it's not just the instruments that crashes, right? I use a leaf lander at six down. So every instrument set is not contaminated. Sorry, we can't use leaf landers anymore. Sorry, you can't use gallons anymore. Sorry, we can't use this instrument anymore. So what would you like to use? So when you talk with the owner, when I do, right, as I consult with all the spaces, you tell me what you want and I will get it for you. 
But you can't keep using the gain perception and then complain about the ration. You can't keep using putting together your circum, uh, circumcision device, right? Some, some folks are still using the old metal. Uh, you can't put all those together for your convenience because the threads on that screw are not getting touched by steam. So why is that acceptable to you? But this isn't. I agree, this is a standard, and that's the best information we have. But none of the IFUs, I can pull you five IFUs, SC79 and ARN, none of them match. They're all contradictory to one another. So it's about, it's not compromising for the sake of compromising, it's compromising using scientific knowledge and figuring out what the best solution is for that operator. Does that make sense? Yeah, short thing just came out with, uh, Single wrap items, and they stop deciding organization when they have instruments that are rational when they find them on the shelf because it's basically like said because of all the touching. How many people are going into touching that uh, fill pad? Right, and if you if you put a ratcheted item like a ring instrument inside a fill pad, you see the pictures I showed you. How many they're shoving in the drawer? You think it's not going to get ratcheted? So it wasn't probably still processing. It was the way you were storing it that caused it. So steam did touch it. It just happens to be ratcheted because you put 75 on them in a drawer that should fit five, right? Um, next question. Any other comments? Yeah. Um, it was your thoughts on what trade? Have you used them? Do you like them? Do you think it's a nice alternative instead of flashing? Is it instead of flashing? So there's a lot of debate right now. So the short answer is I like one trade. Okay. Um, but the, it's kind of that sacred cow, right? When we find water in something, we consider it not sterile, right? It's contaminated. But it's sterile water, right? Because it never left the container. So there's a lot of issues there. But they went through many, 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 many years of validation. And everything came up good, right? So, but it's convincing us that it's okay to have a little water. The second thing is it took the 30 days. So we cleaned it properly and it went through the decontamination process prior to putting in one tray and doing that so-called IUSS. We can put it on the shelf. So I can use it tomorrow or a week from now. So I like that. But there's still some debate out there, and Amy's having some conversations about it. Um, because technology, we can't keep up with the technological changes in the streets going on. We're doing the best we can. That kind of answers to Susan's question, too. Is it the best we can with what we know today? But overall, I like it. The, the trays I used to use in the past were flashbacks, and you had to bend it every, you had to bend the top end of it. Uh, nobody was bending. And then they went to a ceramic version, but you couldn't, once it was done, you had to break it open. One tray went a step further. So if you one tray, is that still considered a flash it or anything? It's not. So you should have to that as your statistics. Just to clarify for your pictures, you're saying that you wrap the items and you should not just step up your pocket and tell you to Correct. So she's asking about the blue wrapper and, and clarification whether or not you can sack or not. No, you cannot. You're not supposed to sack that. What typically happens is the IFU is in the bottom of the box, usually. At least that's what Kimberly Clark and Cardinal have been doing for a long time. And nobody reads it because it's not going to be attached. So they just throw it out of the box. And then you take the wrapper out, which has plastic and shrink wrap on it, right? So if you read those, it'll tell you uh, a little bit more about the product. But the reason is, um, there's a compression factor in the digital wrap. And when you lift the heavy instruments up off another, it causes that to have that. So it pulls dust or air in. I just don't, because of the VR organization, they're not changing that right now. They're not. I'm going to tell you, it's going to, for 10 years from now, I'll see it. So, with good organizations, especially ones in the news, I guarantee they found the money for everybody to restore it properly. Man. Can be the blue package cannot be stacked together by the trays. Metal trays can because they're rigid, right? There's not there's not a compression factor. Now, uh, so what's your take on metal substitute for that monitor trays, 
groups that are already kind of generally that have been in their trunk for God knows how long, in these rubber baby boats for God knows how long. Um, and like, what's your take on that? Plus, where do you store this stuff if they can find it? In my opinion, it should be in the same type of storage room where your instruments are. So, so, who asked the question? Your question. So, one is the implant, right? It's sterile, it's an appeal pack, right? Like, like, usually, the high back and plastic will open it up. It's sterile, but what she's saying is how they store it, right? So, if it's in a plastic coat, it's in their vehicle for months or in their garage, technically, it's in their plastic coat, it's in their vehicle for months or in their garage, technically, I wouldn't use it. But how do you validate that, right? So you have to work with your vendors, and I would encourage them to consign, since it's a consign item anyway, consign it at your organization. You create a bin for them, it can be locked, whatever. But I would rather buy a cabinet for a few hundred dollars and let store it for me. As far as the instrumentation is, you are absolutely correct. The instrumentation that is longer, uh, whether it's longer for the day or for two days, or it's consigned to you, should be stored properly. An instrumentation will show supplies are supposed to be in a low traffic area with temperature and humidity controls that you can manage, whether you're doing it manually or whether Johnson controls or somebody else is doing it for you automatically. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah, at our hospital, like they say, you can't, you can't stack the, uh, the new wrap. So they have to be like rubber based trays that have holes in them. That's a good issue. Yeah, they, they stack they stack. That. You're still causing the question. Okay. Because, well, that, that was your solution. Yeah. The jury rigging was the best they could do. So, listen, we're going to be out of time because I've got um, them trying to get you out of here because it's on their presentation. Um, please take a card. I'll step in the back and answer all of your questions. Uh, Thank you very much. <laughs>